Welcome to the Fancier Brew Podcast. I'm Andy, the Northern Diver. In this series, I'll be discussing adventure, conservation, and progression in scuba diving with some really interesting and inspirational divers that you might or not have heard of. The podcast is supported by Northern Diver International and you, the listener, through Patreon. So grab yourself a brew and enjoy this week's episode. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. And you, mate. How's it going? Long time no see since uh, Northern Diver. I know, yeah. Uh, to be fair, that only feels like last year, but it was probably the year before. Was it 2019, that? I think it was, mate. I think it was the back end of that year, so pre-ridiculousness. Um, yeah, it was. It was the back end of that year, mate. No, actually, do you know what? It might have been earlier, earlier last year. Super early. Um, yeah, it was, because it was all about me spending money on training, so I had to get it in before... <laughs> No, I, no, it was. It was. It was December time, I think. But anyway, hey, how's life, Possibly. mate? Right? Yeah, I'm all right. I've, uh, I've, I've done a couple of videos. Obviously, you've, you've probably seen what I've been doing. Yeah. And a company called Orca Torch. I don't know if you come across them. Right. But, um, they wrote to me a couple of weeks ago and said, "We'd like you to do a video to sort of highlight, you know, our, our new product line." So they gave me yeah. this, this torch. It's 160 quid. Will you make it? Will you make a little unboxing video for us? Because I've done one. I bought a new camera housing a few weeks ago. Yeah. And it, they must have seen that and thought it was okay. So they said, yeah, I will send you a torch. Will you do this unboxing video? I spent days on it. And I just can't learn my lines. I'm just... Yeah, 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 in, yeah. In mong mode, honestly. It's horrendous. <laughs> That's what superstardom does to you, mate. <laughs> Behave. Well, I did, um, I did a really good attempt at it earlier on today. And I have my camera just sat here, mm. but there must be some interference with this mic that I'm talking on and the one that's like mounted on the top of my camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got all my lines right and it was perfect. The lighting was good. And then I've played it back on my computer here and it's just popping and fizzing all the way through. I'm like, what on earth can it be? Oh, this? So having a buzzer. So it's kind of like, I, I could have done with you going, I'm, I'm busy at work. I don't want to do this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to be honest, mate, I'm 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 as flexible as you are. So if you've got no, it's if you've right. got stuff Let's to nail, we can crack it. Yeah, yeah. Nah, it, 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 the thing is, I, the attempt I have done, I've sent it to them. Mm. Gone. Are you happy with this? And they seem to be, but I'm not happy with it. It needs to be yeah. proper eye. And if someone's paying, yeah. then it's a bit different. Than it's got to be top dollar. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Thing is, if you're not happy with it, you know, you know what right looks like. So if you want to get it right yourself, yeah. it's it's you're beating yourself up, isn't it? It's like. Absolutely. Well, you know, with photography, you take a picture and you go, oh, if only I'd just done this or that. Or, yeah. Yeah, uh, so yeah right. It, it'll Absolutely. come. I mean, I, I, I've just had a chat. I was having dinner there and I was telling my wife and she said, you know what, perhaps just leave it. Leave it till Saturday yeah, or Sunday yeah. And, yeah. and just come back to it and, and maybe I'll just bang it out. I know the, I know the lines. I just yeah. keep, I'll say a word that doesn't exist <laughs> or I'll say a word that sounds like the word it should be. Um, I, what was I say? Oh, you've got you to gotta press the button twice in quick succession. And I hmm. said concession, <laughs> but I didn't realise at the time. Like, no, nah, that can't be right. So, um, <laughs> have you seen that the military have, have launched or the MLD have really released their own podcast and they've called it Fancy a Brew? Get out of it, Bertie. I hope you've, uh, I hope you've copyrighted that. And I hope you're going to sue them for millions. <laughs> well, I wrote to him on their Instagram page today and I said, I think we need to have a chat about your podcast name. <laughs> it's had right, loads dude. of likes. Yeah. But to be fair. The, well, I'm not the only one that's called. That's why mine's called. I was scuba diver. Fancy a brew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but if people type in fancy a brew podcast on just Google, hopefully they'll come across mine and the other one. There is another one out there. And if yeah, you're scuba sure. divers, you can't help but notice that yeah. the, the sort of the logo is a. a that's scuba it. Diver, yeah, so, yeah. So fingers crossed. <laughs> are, are you a colonel yet, or what? Uh, mate, no, you're joking. I'm still a, I'm still a lowly major. I was lucky to make Lance Corporal, mate, so I'm happy. <laughs> Fair one. Right, so Mick Stewart, welcome to Fancy a Brew Podcast. Have you got How a you brew, doing? mate? I have indeed got a brew. There's, there's the swigging? proof. Oh, proper I'm swigging, Scottish I'm mug swigging as well. coffee at the minute. Do you know the, the history of this mug? So Go that on. that there is is Glenlivet Tartan. So I was right. I was born and brought up in a little place called Glenlivet, which is not too far from where I'm now. And my old man was a, a brewer at a distillery. So he used to make whiskey. So that's the official tartan of Glenlivet. There you go. That's the history to that awesome. mug. And that's probably 30 year old, that mug now. So I'll, 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 you watch, I'll break it tonight. <laughs> Don't. So people who've probably listened to this podcast in the past might remember that we had a guy on um, called Stuart Lawson. Unfortunately, he got blown up in a tank. 
Uh, he got severely burned and he had loads of issues after that. But he sort of battled back, <laughs> for want of a better term. He battled back and managed to get into the water and started diving and found a real release of life. And he sort of put a lot of that onto your shoulders. It, you know, he, he sort of mm. sp- spoke quite well of, of how you'd integrated him into that and brought him through as a diver and been on loads of cool trips away. So that's why I've obviously got you back on. Well, got you on initially to talk about that. But if you can give us a bit of a, a bit more into your sort of career, let us know who you are, what you're about, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Yeah, so I mean, so I've well, obviously you know I'm in the army, so I've been a, I've been a, a royal engineer. I joined the army when I was 16, and I 34. I know I don't look that old, Andy, but 34 years down the line, um, I'm still here. I'm still doing it. Um, so military engineer, but do you, as as part of, of what engineers do, we get the option to dive. So that got yeah. me into diving to start with, and that was about. 20, 23 years ago now, thereabouts. And as I've, what was really interesting was military diving was great and I was doing underwater engineering, but actually I didn't spend as much time underwater as, as, I, as I wanted to. So I then took up recreational diving to do more diving. And that was, that was, that was a kind of revelation for me. So I've, I've kept all of it going. So my God, what I start, I started off as a military diver and then I did a paddy instructor course, what across the paddy. And then I did a bit of beast, beast sack stuff. And then I became an instructor with them. So I've just kind of bounced around and I basically I've just, yeah. just pimped myself out to who, whoever will die for me, basically. <laughs> hey, so we kind of met through your wife and through my mate, uh, our joint mate, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Because I needed, I needed a supervisor, didn't I, for a, my first expedition I was running to Malta and loads of things went wrong in the lead up to that. So one of the other supervisors had a heart attack. So I had to go on the supervisor's course. I'd never done anything like that before. So it was a massive... Shock and awe to me. So when we went mm. out to Malta, you, you were a proper support to me and you, you helped me with loads of other things after that. So I can't thank you enough. And and again, thanks for coming on this. Yeah, you know what? That was a great trip. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> I'd, I've been back to Malta twice and I'd go again tomorrow, given the choice. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much easy diving to be done there mm. and mm. so much to see and do. Um, but what would you describe through your career, whether it be the commercial side of diving as a military diver or the recreational What's probably the the coolest, the best, most memorable dive you've done? Oh, do you know what? Funnily enough, I didn't even know you can ask me this question, but I was thinking about that today. And right, let's do both. So the coolest military dive I've done, or the coolest place I've dived. So um, it was I was in Iraq in two thousand and three, and we did some dive tasks. We basically, um, without digging it up, pulled some explosives off a bridge that had been blown up, um, yeah. and prepped it ready to get rebuilt and and uh, open up the road again so but that was a great job but we were doing sort of opportune searches wherever we were so we ended up diving so where the where the river tigris meets the river the river um tigris and the euphrates they meet together in a in a in a sort of and the the, the biblical site of that is supposed to be the garden of eden now it's nothing like the garden wow. of eden it's it's a desert i think there's one plant growing there but um, really? but that was that was quite, was really interesting that and that kind of stuck with me to go my god if this is true, you know, you're talking biblical diving in a in, yeah. in the middle of Iraq it was quite surreal, so that was quite that was quite interesting it was more location the diving was rubbish it was just uh, yeah. just a muddy river, but the um but the best recreational dive I've done I was out in South Africa, uh, again on another military trip me you, know, you, you I, I should be advert- I should be recruiting on this on this chap <laughs> yeah. so yeah we were doing some diving and we what we were doing was we were looking for uh, sharks so we're doing shark baited shark diving which is kind of a you know a lot of people would go should you shouldn't you do it but you hang a bait ball in the water the sharks come you get in and dive look at the sharks everyone gets out everyone's happy and they were mainly sort of little black tip reef sharks so you're talking about a meter long or whatever but I then stayed for another week after the trip. So I stayed with this guy called Mark Addison, who's a prolific sort of shark dude out in South Africa. And he wanted to, uh, to catch a tiger shark. But his deal was with a local aquarium in, in um, um, God, what was it, Durban. So the local aquarium in Durban is called Lushaka. And he was getting really annoyed. He's a conservationist. So the locals were catching a shark, put it in an aquarium. And tiger sharks don't live well in captivity. So they, they last for about I don't know, three or four months and then they die. So Mark said, right, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'm going to catch a shark for you, but I'll replace it every two months. So it's catch and release. So I'll have a little swim in the aquarium, a little holiday, goes back to the sea, everybody's happy. So I was sitting in this boat with Mark. I said, Mark, 
you know, I was I was helping him get finding the shark. I said, hang on, mate, we haven't even talked about how we're going to catch. How, how are we going to catch this damn shark? He said, that's easy. We'll just swim a hook into his mouth. I went, oh, just like that. <laughs> so, so, that's what, so luckily, <laughs> luckily, we didn't get a, a, a little, the little shark he was after on that dive. Yeah. But I, we hung about a little bit. And he stuck his head in the water. And uh, he went, oh, it was a big one down there. So it's the first time I'd seen a tiger shark. So we got in the water. And he and I got in. It was a three and a half meter female white tiger shark. And a, a, a female tiger shark, and my God, beautiful specimen. Quite interesting, you know, no, no cages, nothing else. But there was no body language to say the shark's going to be a threat. <laughs> then Mark got out. So I was solo with this, me and this, me and this tiger. Yeah, no, no, solo diving. Yeah, yeah. So just, yeah, just but free, so, but like you're not in a cage. Yeah, or, yeah not in a cage. No, no, no just something about with my camera. I had my camera in front of me. It was all right. I could, yeah. I could have fended it off for the camera. But um, it, was, it was absolutely surreal. You know, the whole of the whole of the ocean, me and a and a tiger shark. So that was pretty cool. That was that's probably the coolest thing I've done. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm hoping we'll get something similar. We're going to Gansby in um in September. Oh doing nice a white research trip, obviously. Nice. If we're allowed to and and if nothing happens before and then yes. So I'll tell you what's really interesting about Great Whites. So I've done another trip to South Africa, just a, a holiday trip. We we actually weren't didn't do much diving on, on off Cape Town, but we did the usual holiday maker, get in a cage and dip your head down and have a look at the great whites. And I tell you what, there's something else. So the tiger, I didn't feel threatened by the tiger, but making eye contact with a great white is probably the only thing, less a hippo or a croc, that I wouldn't want to be in the open ocean with. So they just look evil. They're absolutely. Yeah. They're beautiful creatures, but my God, mm. they are they are just pure killing machines, I think. Well, they, they, they look full of scars. They look like, like mm. a bouncer, don't they? It's just <laughs> <laughs> ready to pounce. They look like Steve Kirk, but that's what he looked like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He never listens to these, so he's never going Oh, you're off, joking. He's <laughs> terrible. He's featured on two of them and then never never listens. He's terrible. <laughs> so um, getting on to cool stories, Louise tells me he jumped in once with your P-zip open. That, that's oh, pretty God. horrendous, isn't it? That was a that was a special moment. I'll give you a little story about that. So uh, yeah, go on. Because I do like a story. But the I was we were we were preparing to go away to Afghanistan. Actually, we got these new suits, um, and they'd just come out of the wrapper. So I they were they were a little thin membrane suit. So I said to the guys, I said, look, there's no point going out to Iraq and opening your uh, to Afghanistan and opening the bag and getting your suit on. You, know, you need to try it out before we go. So we'll go down to Vobster Key down in um, in Froome. And we'll have a dive in it. So I went right, and they were looking at me like I was stupid. It's like it's about two degrees in the water, and this little crisp packet, thin suit. Yeah. We put it on. I went, no, no, no. You, you don't get it. You, you wear warm kit under a, under a thin suit. You know that's what you do. So you can yeah. wear as much kit as you want. So anyway, I had my gear on, and I jumped in the water. And yeah, that immediate realization that Oosh. when they'd made the suits, the Velcro flap was closed, but the zip was open. So <laughs> so obviously I was the I was the I was the sacrificial lamb on that one. Man alive, that was cool. So that was a cool dive. That was, I tell you what, yeah. well, that's probably one of the coldest dives I've done. Um, because obviously I just shut my zip and carried on, but I was yeah. absolutely, I was in the shower for about a day, warming up after that one. <laughs> See, the cool thing now is to try and do more cold water immersion, isn't it? I've been cold Ooh, showers yeah. and go wild swimming. People seem yeah. to be thriving on it for loads of different health reasons. I'm trying it myself and I don't feel what any do better for having a cold shower. Yeah, well, that's the same. You know what? I was, I had, uh, I'm doing a, a bit of a sort of high performance coaching course at the minute. And it's one of these, oh, you're bad. I'm doing it as a group. I'm doing all these bad habits stuff. So the guy who's doing it, he's pretty, he's bought into all this stuff. And it's not about me being a coach. It's about coaching me, managing my diary better and staying off the bruise. Yeah, that's working really well. Yeah. But, um, you know, <laughs> but he said the same. He said, yeah, yeah. And I have a cold shower every morning. He's like, no, I'm not there yet, mate. I get it. And it's open water swimming and stuff. But I quite like the warmth, mate. I quite like a warm shower. Yeah. I suppose it's doing no, no harm to my fuel bill because I turn the cold on. <laughs> I mean, rinse me air, quick wash, and I'm out. Whereas, <laughs> I put the, if, if I'm on a full bore hot, as hot as it'll go shower, it's not that powerful anyway. But I'll stand under there with my phone. Yeah. Probably just have a soak for twenty minutes, and I'll get out. <laughs> my fuel fuel bill's gone, pff, smashed to the top. It's horrendous. Let's talk a little bit about my military career. Then. What kind of diving do military divers generally do in the army? Yeah. So you've got. So the Navy, you would you would think routinely that the Navy do all the diving. Um, so the Navy, the, we've got our own lanes effectively. So the, the Navy do um, 
underwater uh, that sort of bomb disposal, if you like, but more to do with sea mines and shipping. Yeah. So they'll do, they'll, they're traditionally clearance divers. So they clear the shipping lanes of, of mines that are a threat to shipping. Um, go, go out in the mine hunters, identify a mine, diver goes down, deals with it, comes back out. So basically, that in a, in a real nutshell, that's what they do. They do other stuff as well, like kind of terrorist stuff. Um, very much at sea. So the army diver is more like an underwater engineer. Um, so within the army, there's a couple of groups that do it. So the Royal Engineers predominantly do the, the engineering side, the, the underwater dive, the engineering side. And the Royal Logistic Corps, because they do ports, they've got a little team down in Southampton um, and they, they do the port operation side as well. So there's about 13 teams in the army, about 18 strong. And it's more like, a, it's not a full time, for, for, we have full time roles to look after the equipment and the management of it. But my job is not full time as such. So, although it feels full time a lot of the time, but yeah, we do we do things like um, pretty much everything a commercial diver would do. So, search and recovery, pipeline repair, um, we do cutting, we do demolitions. Quite quite interesting. Um, we do surveys, we open ports, um, we do bridge recce's. So, I mean, basically, it's just taking engineering underwater. So, for the diving of that part, it's just a means of breathing while you get to work. Um, yeah. So that's the that's the kind of military engineering part of it. So yeah, but that's that's interesting. It's kept me. It's probably what's kept me in the army, if I'm honest. You know, all this time. Yeah, weren't you getting involved in something quite recently that got got shut down? You, you yeah, to... yeah, yeah. So um, so we last had quite an interesting task last year. So remember when the port in Beirut got blown up? The uh, yeah. the grain uh, the grain exploded. Well, it was um, it was fertilizer, wasn't it? But fertilizer it exploded in the grain silo and caused the perfect storm and it, it was the, a, a biblical explosion in the port so um very quickly after that they thought well hang on a minute we we need that's how the, the sea and the port is how we operate that's how we get all our food in so the whole country was was gonna gonna starve so the uk government was asked what we could do uh, so th then they said to the army look what can you do and then we um so we did all the prep work for it and we were going to go out there and open up the shipping lanes and inspect the port, make sure it was safe underwater, get a ship alongside. Um, but, uh, but yeah, as it was, as time moved on, it, the underwater damage wasn't quite as bad. So sadly, there were some bodies, bodies to be removed and, and the Lebanese and the French um, did that job. But there wasn't that much surveillance. So we were literally on the bottom step of the plane, ready to go, but, um, but called back at the last minute. So that would have been a very interesting job. But you know, it's sad times, but um, would have been a really interesting job in, in that environment. So that's the kind of thing, yeah, that's the kind of thing we can get stepped up for. Would, would you generally get involved in getting actually in the water? Or would you, are you more of a supervisor now? With well, you know me, Andy. <laughs> you... <laughs> Forward roll, mate, straight in. No problem. So uh, if, yeah. I think I am guilty of wanting to get in the water. Yes, a bit of both, really. So when you're on site, you're a diver as well. So you're a supervisor and planner, but you need hands all the time because you know it's there's a small team. Everyone's got a part to play. So uh, so yeah, I'd I'd, I'd be I, I, if I wasn't in the water, I'd be really disappointed. <laughs> so what what sort of led you into working through joint services and doing the instructor role? What what was the the drive to become an instructor and, and sort of pass that information on for you? Yeah, that's really interesting because, so as a military diver, I didn't tell you this bit, I, I spent two years at a defence diving school teaching military diving. Um, right. So so that gave me the kind of instructional bug and I thought, oh, I can do this stuff. And then I started, then I transferred across to just dive, as you said, to be a, be a recreational diver and do more. Mm. And it was natural progression. So I got an opportunity to go and do a paddy instructor course, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I thought it was great. What I love as well, and, and the people who are listening to this will, they'll be your classic wet well, paddy, warm water divers and bees are cold water divers, all very miserable, really fat, big beers, a bit like me. But um, <laughs> I love that. I love this banter between the organizations. It's mega bad for diving when people are slating each other's organization. But I just think, what are you doing? So I, I love sitting on the fence and listening to them. Well, actually, I've done the paddy bit and, and it was all right. And I've done the b -sat bit and it was all right. And, you know, I love I love the idea that it's all about diving. Who cares what organisation you're with? Who gives a monkey? As long as it's safe and you're enjoying it, you know, it's fantastic. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so many. And isn't it, I like these new organisations that are coming in as well. So you've got things like RAID, which I don't know too much about, but I'm hearing good things about. And uh, there's, a, there's a few other there. So... No, watch out, watch the Paddy and b watch your back. There's, there's other people out there as well. I think it's 
it's different how the, these new organisations are coming in. They're coming in as as a business now, rather than mm. like a club model. The the model mm. is completely different, and it's perhaps appealing more to people to do the home learning. Certainly in the mm. scenarios we're in at the minute, you know, well, yeah, learnings, really. I don't learn very well that way. I'll be honest. So I'm when I did my um, CCR mod one just before Christmas. All the learning was online and without having someone at the side of me that or in front of me that I can sort of question and, and debate a little bit around, sometimes I just read a load of big words and they're, they're quite confusing to me. So <laughs> I, we all learn differently, don't we? So it's, you know, it's horses for courses, but fortunately mm. I had quite a good instructor, very good instructor in case he's listening, uh, <laughs> that when I got there, I could ask a lot of questions throughout the instructional, uh, the, the sort of physical aspects of the instruction. So that's mm. helpful. Mm. But... Um, so yeah, we uh, we ran a, an expedition, didn't we, to Malta a couple of years ago, and uh, mm. that was quite adventurous. And, and obviously, I've, I've been diving with your wife a couple of times before that. So, mm-hmm. uh, what what's your next exped? Have you got any coming up that you can plan? Well, so yeah, we've got a little bit of a drama at the moment, haven't we? We've been a bit dry for a, for a year yeah. or so. But um, so the next exped I've got coming up. So we've got a plan to go to the west coast of Scotland. So keep it local. Right. Um, so there's a great diving area between the Isle of Skye and the mainland um so Kyle of Lokalsh that area there so we've got a little plan to go and do some stuff up there um there's there's always something bubbling under you never know what's coming up next but Malta's been mentioned possibly Egypt in the summer I mean it's all this is all dependent on the situation isn't it but um and then what we have got though we've got another um uh sort of diving with the injured expert planned funnily enough that, that we discussed that on Saturday and that's going to be likely the Maldives so where we I think Stu wow. we took Stu to the Maldives so uh um so yeah so that's that's the next that's the, the look forward to I think but yeah it should be nice to get back in the water wouldn't it yeah so let's let's touch on we'll stay on the military bit for a second and then, and we'll obviously gravitate onto the next bit but you were quite in, instrumental weren't you with the battle back scheme with help for heroes the sort yeah. of back end of, of Afghanistan and that it was indeed yeah so um so I interestingly I I was in Afghanistan in 2008 um, and then at the time when I came back there was a I was part of well I still am part of the army sub aqua diving association so I'm the diving officer for that night but at the time I was looking after the equipment because I'm a bit of a, a bit of an equipment geek and um, Does one that of the guys got loads and loads and loads of kit oh you don't want to see my garage at the moment it's un- unbelievable I need to let go but yeah <laughs> well you know the score about that <laughs> yes but um, yeah, so I, we were discussing um, lots and lots of injured people. I then saw a presentation on, on Battleback, which was um, a Headley Court, so a rehabilitation centre, a really powerful brief of a guy called Ash Clare, who said, um, yeah, we've got all these injured guys, we've got so many um, amputees and injured this, injured that. And he said, but look at this. And he's got this exercise called Timmy's Paddle and, and uh, the guys, you know, rehabilitation through just doing stuff so good for the mind good for the body good for the soul um kayaking climbing parachuting you name it and we thought well what about diving you mentioned diving yet mate he's like well can we do that you know the guys are pretty injured well well let's have a go so ultimately a guy called guy wallace who was the chairman at the time ex-falcons vet had dived with a guy routinely with a guy with a miss who's missing below the knee and he went well nothing wrong with Geordie, you know, that was all right. And um, so we hatched a plan and and John Gibbon was the lead, the lead element. I don't know if you met John, but he was the lead element in it all. So anyway, hatched a plan, had a chat with the Battleback team and said, right, how do we do this? Because there's some pretty horrendous injuries out there. So as you know, you've got to be medically fit to go in the water. So that would have been the only barrier. So the, the docs had a good look at the guys and they went, well, give them dive medicals. And they said, yep, you know, you're fit to dive. And, and it was a really you know the doctor was putting his putting his neck on the line basically but he would say you know actually in my opinion lungs are okay ears are okay um got a few bits missing got a few wounds etc but you'll probably be okay to dive but let's take it let's take it nice and easy so we started off doing try dives in the pool and this was that was his early days so like we, we were learning making mistakes as much as anyone else but and we were learning along the way so back in 2009 we did the first Battleback diving expedition, um, Help for Heroes uh, sponsored, Headley Court provided the guys, and they had a multi-activity camp out there. We did loads of try dives in the sea on day one, 
and then we'd run a course we'd run an ocean diver course so uh, so yeah it was it was a uh, that was a start that was the very start so six people qualified on that course and it's been it's been going great guns ever since but really interested i mean that that's what that flicked my switch in in how how little i know so when you think you can dive you then go and teach and then you realize how much you actually don't know and then you become probably a better diver because you actually need to understand the theory that you that you're delivering um then you switch it up to that and you think my god i'm back to i know nothing these guys are brilliant and I know nothing. So I've got to catch up with them um, to, uh, you know, to be able to, to transfer what they know into, into diving. So it's, it's great. It's great for the mind. Do you think that's what encouraged um, associations like BSAC perhaps to start developing the diving for all program? Yeah, that's interesting. So, so I'm involved in that now. Um, I think I, I always have been. So John, John was the man for this. So John Gibbon took, um, took what was called, uh, was it disabled? I can't even remember what it's called now. Disabled diving, um, which is a horrible name in it, on it in itself. Yeah. And then and then transferred it to uh, diving for all. And using all of those lessons, we got rid of all the outdated BSAC gumph, um, which was you no know, written in the fifties probably, and overlaid the stuff that we'd done. So we kind of brought it on a little bit, but quite military focused though. So my, you know, I'm rewriting the. Um, the lesson stuff for that now at the moment well uh -huh. if dennis is watching i promise to start rewriting the lesson pack for it <laughs> but um so dennis wig and i are involved in, in moving diving for all to the next level but I, i'm really conscious in the fact that it's quite it was predicated around the, the military wounded service person um and with an, a bit of other adaptive needs thrown in so i'm quite keen to get really deep into the the, the the whole spectrum and that's for want of a better word from someone who's got um a a bit of a learn you've just mentioned it there so you you don't take on board the the visual learning type thing off a off a screen nor do i i'm terrible at it so we all know how we like to learn so some people take that to the extreme so it's how we adapt our style so they get the best possible chance of taking the information on board um, and then moving on. So that, that's what I'm looking forward to at the moment is, is diving for all and sort of scrubbing up the lessons, having a little look around and making sure we, we get it right because we have to, it's important. So how do the sort of layperson, you know, obviously I'm an instructor, but how can I get involved with the DFA within BSAC? Well, it's, it's really simple. So all you do is say, um, I, I quite fancy the idea and you go along to a course it's a one day course um, and it just teach so what it does what it does it doesn't teach you how to be an instructor because you know that already but what it will do is give you it'll give you some tools so it won't say and and i've i've learned from this in the past so let's say um i'll give you an example that i can uh, that i know really really well so a, a guy who's missing both his legs and an arm so you've got a diver with one good arm and and you have to um you have to think right how firstly how are we going to get in the water oh my god how are we going to get out how's he going to control his buoyancy how's he going to recover his regulator how's he going to clear his mask and all these little things and how's he going to do it all at the same time and you, you blow your own mind um and when just when you think you've so we'll, we'll sort of the, the the course will give you some tools to think about how you might get around the issue um with more importantly with the individual so you don't you don't make up you don't make up the plan it's a two-way process right. so you but what works for diver a who's only got his right arm doesn't work for diver b who's only got his right arm so you've got to start again and you think oh my god i've, I've, I've got to work it out so yeah. it's the, the 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 course will give you the tools you need I, I, my little mantra to myself is never and this is the same whether whether people are are fully functioning or at the, at the opposite end of a huge, horrible spinal injury is never make, never bring them out of the water in a better condition or no worse than they went in. So, you know, you want to try and make sure that they enjoy the experience. And that's regardless of age, gender, whatever. Make sure they enjoy it. Um, don't injure them. Don't break them any more than they already are. And allow them to, to enjoy it. Because you know what it's like. How many people have you, have you seen in the past on tri dives didn't like that well you didn't like it because the instructor probably wasn't very good but you've put them off for life so what they what could have been a really yeah. enjoyable sport for them they haven't done so so yeah so the course 
the course will give you some tools. It will give you a little bit of theory, um, quite a bit practical about just little tips and tricks. And I say we're still learning. We're all still learning. But, but then focus on the individual, not, not on yourself and how good an instructor you think you are. It's about helping the individual get yeah. deal with what you think is normal to them is not, you know. I suppose those tools would help any instructor with 100%. any person. 100%. That. So, like, it, they don't have to have a, a an, what do you call it, an abnormality? You know, they don't have to have something missing mm, mm. For, for you to be able to apply some of that tools. Or some of those I'll give you a, to... I'll give you a really good example. The um, so someone is struggling to clear their mask. We've all had that, um, and there's there's more than one way to clear a mask. But I remember I I had a girl in in fact it was on that diving trip in South Africa, and she'd been given up on by the instructor. So he went, no, oh, she's she, she's not diving for the rest of the trip. I've given up, and then they went off and did open water dive one. I was thinking, hang on a minute, sharks out there. I want to be out there. But I said, right, give give me give me a go. Let me have a go. So I do, I do like a challenge. And we were in the pool um, and stupid little things like no one had thought about just getting water in her face to start with. You know, the, the first thing you do when you teach somebody to dive is say, right, take your mask off, take your face in the water, have a little, yeah, see what it feels like. And then that, that gets rid of a lot of the phobias. So slowly, slowly, we managed to get her around to, it. I talk about adapting. So she had a snorkel on um, and I was hands on her shoulders, pushing her head underwater to um to clear them obviously completely in control and there was no yeah there was there's no attempted murder going on here <laughs> but um you know and and after after a few attempts you know she was she was completely happy so going on from that her first oh, so no one had seen any sharks her first open water dive um in it, doing this doing the ocean diver course there was black tip reef sharks swimming around her she, she was oblivious to it because she's too worried about clearing the mask, but yeah. it was phenomenal. So she would never have seen that. And it's all about adapting. It's patience, adapting, work with the, the person you're working with, you know. So, yeah, good times. Tough. Tough um, sort of training, I think, that though, because I just, for me, the club that I'm with, they do have instructors that teach the DFA sort of syllabus. Mm. And I think to get enough instructional practice is going to be quite hard for me mm. because of the numbers of people that require training within my club. So I'd, it's not something I, I would be put off from doing. It's just the mm. likelihood of being able to use that, that skill set. But I think yeah. then you could apply it, couldn't you, quite easily to other things that you do in the water with other people that perhaps don't learn in the same way. Or Yeah, 100%. Someone's something. got something. Even someone that's carrying, carrying an injury, bad shoulder. Yeah. You know, how do you deal with that as well? There's all sorts of ways and means. It just changes your mindset and it allows you to play with your kit as well because you can fiddle with kit all the time and try and reconfigure it in different ways. That's... I never stop fiddling with kit ever. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> so the, the one thing I do want to discuss that, that we haven't so far is about being a good surface supervisor. Mm. Um, I've not had enough practice at doing it and it's certainly something now I've just completed the HSE Pro Scuba last week mm. that... I might be called on to do a lot more of what mm -hmm. would you say makes a good supervisor a dive supervisor so i that's a really good question andy so i would say um first of all don't be scared to say no um so i uh, and what i mean by that is if the weather conditions weather conditions aren't right or the sea conditions aren't right or the current's not right or something's not right with the equipment don't force it because if, you, as you know, if you go into the water with a problem, it'll become 10 times worse, guaranteed to become 10. That O-ring that you've just thought that'll do, or that little leak that you've got in the equipment will become 10 times worse underwater. So fix it. Whatever's underwater, isn't good. nothing is that urgent. So you know, dive another day, fix it, and come back another day. So that's, that's probably one piece of advice. The other part is you've kind of, you relax into this, but you know as a diver, when the diver's left the surface, when you've given them a proper brief, and they've back briefed to you what the plan is. That's important as well that they understand. Yeah. So what, what do you think you're going to be doing down there? Oh, I'm going to be going down looking for this or turning this nut or whatever, or, or you know, finding this object. This is what I'm going to do when I find it. The back brief is everything. So you know in their mind, they've completely understood what you've been saying and they haven't been um, thinking about Facebook or whatever else they've been up to. So, so yeah, knowing the diver knows the plan is really useful. And then when they've left surface, it's up to them. You know, literally it's there, unless you've got communications and, and all the rest of stuff it's it's down to them so trust your divers 
give them a plan, make sure they understand the plan and they're bought into it. And then um, have a think, the way I think about it as well is, I'll think about it, I sort of visualize. So I'll think about, right, how am I gonna get to site? Oh my God, I need a wagon, I need I need this amount of kit. What safety kit do I need? Quite important, you need your safety kit, particularly at the, um, you know, HSC standards. Um, have I got enough oxygen? Have I got my first aid kit? Um, have I got a, a method of recovering my diver? Where, how am I going to recover a diver to shore if they need help um, or to a point of safety? Where's, how do I get, where, where am I going to see the ambulance? So if you visualize in your mind the worst case scenario where you've got someone just rescued his buddy um, or a solo diver, you've sent a standby diver, diver then to get him, you need, just need to think about, right, okay, he's going to be on the surface now. And you can do this in slow time where you've worked your way right through the plan. And by working through the plan, you find the problems. Because if you've jumped off a dot wall and it's three meters to the sea, happy days. But if there's no ladder to get out on, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> and it happens yeah. a lot. So, so you've just kind of got to walk your way through the emergency action plan, which is great. Um, and then when you've done that, you know, you've done, the, you've done the legal bit and the moral bit that's right. And then the next thing to think about the plan itself. So if you've, you know what it's like, you put, you're going to gear up in a certain place. Well, if that place is not fit to be gearing up, choose somewhere else. Then you do your checks. Never miss a check. That's another one as a, as a supervisor of advice is never, ever miss a check. And we do that, do that ourselves. You know, the, the buddy checks have always got to be right. Um, think about the entry. Think about the descent routine, what they're going to do, what their actions on are, how they're going to monitor the gas. I mean, this is all stuff you do as a diver. So you're kind of thinking for them while they're on task. And, and if you do that, I think you, you've kind of cracked it. Um, look out for hazards. You know, think about ships. Think about um or oh, swell uh tides currents and what they're doing when they're down there as well what you know so my god I've, I've, i could go on for hours on this but i don't know if i could give one one thing but that's the kind of things i think about you know when i'm when i'm yeah. down there as well do you use um like a hard hat or do you use a full face mask when you're doing uh, military diving? we use we use both andy so um so when, when we're self-contained um so think scuba think 12 litre cylinder, um, three litre pony, full face mask, communications, and you've got a little valve on the side of the mask where you can switch to your to your three litre pony. We're kind of looking at changing that at the moment because it's not the best system. Um, it's okay, but it's not the best system. We use that for our shallower stuff and our, our um, you know, boat diving stuff. But then when we get into the underwater engineering side, we're into full commercial. So we've got um, ga uh, gas panels on the surface, um, feed it through an umbilical hose down to the diver and the, and the diver will wear a um, yellow sort of Kirby Morgan helmet um, to do their work in. So that's the hard hat as aspect of it. But yeah. that's, um, and that's really useful because even, even though you've got a, a, you know, a pumped supply down, to, uh, down well, pumped, I'm going back to the old days now, you've got a, <laughs> you've got a pressurized supply down to the diver. You've still got a cylinder on your back, which you can bail out to. So it's, um, it's really safe and it's, it's a really well, trodden path that. so yeah so we do to both. put people in the picture that's like that film the last breath isn't it so oh, that's right yeah 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 there. that was amazing that was nut, oh my god was a nuts story that wasn't it it was absolutely mental yeah i mean what a great story and yeah. and even though i knew so so interestingly so i was on a uh in a team called the defense diving standards team so we were doing all of this um sort of hsc style audits on all of our teams and making sure the safety to operate and looking after the equipment and that was a time when i was down there we used to get the um the um flash reports through all the, all the commercial diving flash reports through and that was on one i was like oh my god this how, did, how what the and i read the report even though i'd read the report that little films come documentary thing absolutely amazing i mean well done the guys that did that yeah we didn't when we first watched it we'd never heard of it we we're just flicking through netflix i think it was and came across it oh it's scuba diving mm. let's watch that and it's not scuba diving clearly yeah but I uh, watched it. It's not a film you can watch twice. And we best not talk about the punchline because it would ruin it for everybody. But I don't That's think a you good could point. watch it twice knowing the outcome. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a cracking film. So take you out the military, take you away from any association. Mm. What, what kind of diving really floats your boat? I am such... Uh, some When some people, people say to me, what's your favourite type of music? And I'll go... I like anything from classical to thrash metal to Johnny Cash and everything <laughs> else in between. So, so that, I'm a little bit like that when I'm diving. So it's, um, yeah. it, if, if I could, now here we go. If I could only dive one type of diving in one location, oh, it's so, so tough. I mean, 
the, the overseas dive and the coral, the, the marine life in the Red Sea, um, in the Maldives and places like that is, is, is stunning. And actually, yeah. it ain't too bad jumping into a, like a bath temperature in your shorty yeah, and uh, getting out and not being freezing, pretty good. But I do like a bit of wreck diving as well, you know, night diving. So if someone said, what's your favorite type of diving? I'd say night diving without a doubt. Love a night dive because I love the 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 calm, the tranquility, the the noises you hear that you don't hear during the day dive. So yeah, so like that's that a tough. Word. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit on the fence for that one, mate. <laughs> I like that word tranquility. I'm always searching for that, and I always yeah. come out with romantic for some reason. But I, <laughs> I do feel it's it's a bit of both. We did yeah. a red sea dive. I did a couple of years ago, um, and Ali didn't come in with me, but there was enough sort of ambient light off the boat that we didn't really need torches or video lights. So we were just sort of cutting around. It was mm. a really white sandy bed where we were. It wasn't too deep. I think it was on the barge, actually. Have you, have you mm. dived the barge? I have, yeah, yeah. Of, yeah, yeah. It's not far off of Agada, is it? Yeah, and yeah. I'm sure it was on there. And there's all these Trevelli and, and, and Jacks and that just cutting around us. Mm. Massive big things just darting in and out. Mm. But it was brill because there was just enough ambient light. And it was almost romantic. You know, mood lighting. Mm. And tranquility is the word, though. I need That's to one, mate. write That's that on one. my monitor here. So next time I talk about it, I remember the word. Do you know I'd forgotten about that bar? So that's one of my favourite night dives because so yeah, much for a little bathtub. There's not much to it. There's so much on it. So much on it. It's a fantastic dive. My camera flooded on there. I think because Ali wasn't getting in with me. I was in. She like pulled on the last minute, and I was like flapping trying to get my camera ready. And you know the little sachet that you sometimes put inside your ca- inside your camera housing to mm. to soak up the moisture. Mm. I think it got caught in my O-ring, and as I've jumped in. I've not done the test shot on the surface to find out it was working. Oh, it's dropped an expensive down. mistake. Yeah, dropped down and it said uh, SD card error. I was like, turn it off, enjoy the rest of the dive. And then towards the end, I, I put it back on and all I could see through the port and through the actual viewfinder was water. I was like, oh, devastating. Yep. We've all been you there. You can't just it's... rush up, can you? Oh, no. It's it's one of those, it's just it's electronics and water don't mix, do they? But it's it's a it's a sinking feeling when yeah. when that happens. Oh well. So do you, do you take a camera? Do you have a camera? Do you take one in with you regularly? I love or? it. Yeah, I I I kind of I'm kind of strapped to my camera. I've gone from stills camera to video now. I, like, I love a GoPro because it's so simple. But I've mm-hmm. kind of progressed. I've I've realised. In fact, you've done enough. Uh, you've know, done a lot of underwater videography and stuff. Yeah. That it's all about the lights. So the camera's great. But if you don't have the right lights, it's you know, you're wasting your time. So, um, so I, I, I really enjoy a bit of a sort of amateur, enthusiastic amateur underwater video. Um, it's a, yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. I like cutting together a little film at the end of a trip as well. So I'll do about three minutes, which is probably as much as people can tolerate. You know, <laughs> pick, pick a tune, stick a little bit, bit of uh, video to it. So, uh, yeah, 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 it's good. Did I do one for Malta? I think I might have done. I'm I don't remember. I've I've not got one. I think maybe one of the lads, Luke Griffin, might have done one, or I've seen mm. one that he did. But that might I've been on a couple of trips with Luke, so mm-hmm. it might be it could have been my stag do. It could have been the first one we went yeah. out to Kirkman's <laughs> house. I don't know, but yeah, um, I think you did actually. Yeah. Where, good, yeah. where would you post? Do you post on YouTube or? It'd be on YouTube. Yeah, I'll send you a link. I'll send you a link. I'm Ace. sure I've got it. I'm sure I've got it. Ace. Well, I'll I'll put some links in the bottom of the stuff that you've done. Yeah, there. brilliant. Didn't didn't you say something about the the whole of all the diving sort of groups within the military get together? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, we've got. A, so that's another thing I've developed while being in the military is um is a diving concentration. Uh, and it worked. You know what? It would work for any any diving organisation. But you get all the dive teams together in one place, and we we just share best practice. So we do. Uh, this year we did a port enablement exercise up in Scotland, up where close to where I am now on the Murray Firth, and um. I'll bring every, all the teams in together. So you mix the teams up, they all learn each other little different techniques and stuff. And then you learn sort of by shared experience. So, so yeah, that was a, that was a good little thing. That's in sep- So we're probably gonna do that about September, October time again this year. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I was down at NDAC last Thursday and mm-hmm. uh, your old mob were down there. The Royal Engineers were on there then. That's right. Yeah. So they use that quite a lot for inland, inland training now. The, the Defence Diving School use that quite a lot. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's a great place. Endak is such a good place to train, isn't it? So it's a, I mean, I'm never inland puddles. They're all right. They've, they've got a purpose, but you can't fault Endak for training. My God, you can get every depth from one to 80 meters and good conditions. Yeah, it's good. See, I think a lot of people were pulling the face last year that they completely shut mm. the place. And I don't think they realized why. 
because obviously he needed to make a living, the guy who owns it. He's got a mortgage on it and all the rest of it. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So if he could rent it out to the MOD and mm. make a decent living off it, mm. as opposed to just sporadically open it and not get a decent pay packet, it makes, I know, it makes total a good sense. Point. But yeah. I suppose he probably couldn't broadcast that because of, you know, you don't want the wrong people turning up when the MOD are there, do you? This is, this is true. This is very true. But I suppose uh, the, so the beauty of it is we've always had to train. So, you know, we, we haven't stopped training. Okay, our methods have changed a bit and we've become a, bit, a little bit more COVID compliant, but we still have to train to do the job. So, you know, it's a, you, you, you need the venue still. So the NDAC has been quite useful actually for the guys down there. Mm. And we're still training new divers as well. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's good. Well, they, these are just in normal scuba kits, I think. I think I don't, I don't, but obviously, we were oh, right down the other end of the platform. So, I, yeah, yeah. I had, uh, a pony and a 12 on it looked like but a dumpy 12 it was it was probably then our class two our basic diving course yeah it would have been exactly that they would have been uh they would have been on a course yeah yeah i was supposed to go to try trying to go out with kirkman at the end of this month he's back from mozambique later on in this month so he's invited us out but this was pre the lockdown we're in now we were talking before mm. christmas mm. so i'll be honest i, I don't think it's going to happen We've got a plan, mate. It's a loose plan. Is that when we leave the army, we're probably going to head to Malta or Gozo yeah. for a month, month or so, wow. um, and then probably Lanzarote. So, if you, have you been out? You must have been Lanzarote. So yeah, last January we went. Yeah, it was flipping mm. brilliant. Really loved it. So you know Rubicon diving. You, you yeah. probably dive with them. So Mark Rowe is one of the instructors. A really good mate of mine, Mark. Is right. an ex engineer. Chris. Chris um... Yeah. Christian's, oh, what's his last that's name? That's right. Well, when Christian's the boss. It. Yeah, Christian's the yeah. boss. Massage and Mark's, is, isn't it? Mark's one of the, that's right. Mark's one of the instructors. He's a miserable yeah. guy. He's a great guy. <laughs> Never smiles, but he's he's uber professional. Um, yeah. And he's a he's a bit of a, he's a great, great guy. He's So he let, he's, he's another guy who's followed his heart. So he left left the army, went to yeah. the Caribbean and taught diving, took, took his wife with him. Linda had a, no, she she went there protesting. Um, they, had, they had about five years there. And then they now live in Lanzarote. So Mark Mark is teaching in for that for um, Rubicon. So so they're Mark nice. and, and Steve and Red and the, and the guy will know each other quite well. So yeah, it's all good. Well, that'd be good because I, I need to get more time on this rebreather. I need to build up some hours because mm. I've done. Well, 10. Mark's the man for that as well. So but between Mark and Christian, um, yeah. Mark is a no. He he is a a, a very very good rebreather instructor, and he's. Yeah. I tell you what I like about Mark is he's a bit military. He's a bit no nonsense. So it's you, it's either right or it's not. And if it's not right, he'll tell you. You know, he's not he's not scared to say, mate, I wouldn't do that if I were you. So he's he's well, good. Someone like me definitely needs that. <laughs> well, that is brilliant. But then again, still Steve Kirkman. You know, the two the two are probably peas in the pod because yeah. uh, he'll he'll tell it as it is. <laughs> so when when are you, when are you due to retire? I'm well, this is it, mate. I'm in my last five years now. So I'm, I'm in a no I only look thirty four. I know, yeah, but I say over the last five years, so this is it. My, I'm getting a bit of grind rush. Yeah. So, um, yeah. In fact, you know, I'm coming, up to my, coming up to my last four years. My God, I've just realised I've just lost a year to this bloody pandemic. It's it's scary how quick that last 12 months went, I think. Yeah, right, God, right. yeah, yeah. Just lost, but nuts in it. Right, yeah. go on then. I'll let you get, get off to your wife and have a, the rest of your evening. Oh, yeah. All right, mate. Well, hey, mate, great to talk to you. Nice one. Good Take luck, it easy. Mate. Love to Louise and hey, we'll see do. you later. All Take the best, it easy, buddy. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much to this week's guest for sharing their stories and interesting tales about the underwater world. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did recording it. For more information on this episode, take a look at the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram for the latest news. Thanks again to Northern Diver International and those of you who have supported me through Patreon. Take care and I'll see you on YouTube.